Continuing our study of evolution and um, and what I've subtitled a possible history of the earth um, because we're trying to um, look at the data in a non-conventional way um, but we're trying to be faithful to the scriptures and faithful to the data. Um, so Henry I think has muted everyone. Um, if at any point you have a question feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and ask that question or you can raise your hand by pressing that little icon and Henry will let me know. Um, I will also periodically stop and ask for questions and at that point I'll remind you to unmute yourself. Um, so yeah, there are, uh, we're planning 12 weeks total. Uh, we're in our 11th week, so we're almost done. We just have one more week left, which next week we'll we talk about um, man. Um, and we'll talk about the origin of language and genetics and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but today we're gonna wrap up our study of the fossil record and of animals. So our outline for today, if I can get my mouse back here. Our outline for today is just very simple. First, we're gonna talk about transitional forms. So evolution, macroevolution, um, suggests this idea that uh, one kind of animal can transform into another kind of animal. And we're gonna talk about that but um, in, in general, but then, and then primarily we're gonna take one specific example, which is the whales. And we're gonna talk about whales um, <clears throat> and how the evolutionists argue that, what evidence they use to argue that whales, or how whales evolved, okay? And we'll dissect that. Um, and the next thing we'll talk about is dinosaurs and dragons. Um, and so that's the, that's the, the topics for today. I had more things I wanted to talk about, but we just don't have time. Uh, so this is what we're gonna do today. Um, so the question is, what does the fossil record actually show? And again, if anybody has any trouble hearing me or, or understanding or seeing the slides where I just interrupt or ask Henry, uh, so what does the fossil record actually show? Um, so, so Charles Darwin assumed something called gradualism. We talked about uniformitarianism and gradualism. Those are essentially synonymous. Um, I think for all practical purposes, they're synonymous. Um, but gradualism has more to, has specifically to do with time. This is the idea that um, evolution happens by, by very small increments over a large period of time. And this is still what's mostly taught by um, I would say by schools and by the popular media and so forth. Um, Stephen Jay Gould was a, I mentioned his name before, he was a paleontologist at Harvard. He was a leading, uh, a leading scientist of his day. He passed away a few years ago. Um, and he, uh, I, I found some, he, he just, he's a real clear writer. He has uh, written prolifically. I found some um, things that he wrote that I think are helpful. Um, and so this is a quote of his, and one of his, his essays. He says, the history of most fossil species includes two features particularly inconsistent with gradualism. So he was, he's an evolutionist, but he's against gradualism. Um, and this is, he, this is writing of, uh, I, I don't remember the exact date, but this is probably 20 or 30 years ago, probably in the 80s or 90s would be my guess. Um, and uh, so he says, there, there, there are these two features. One feature is stasis. Um, he says, most species exhibit no directional change during their tenure on Earth. They appear in the fossil record looking much the same as when they disappear. Morphological change is usually limited and directionless. Um, so if you understand what he's saying here, he's saying if you go to the fossil record, which he did for a living while he was alive, he said, if you go to the fossil record, what you will see is that most of the species don't change at all. Um, once they appear, they look the same until they disappear. The other thing is sudden appearance. Um, I probably would have put these in opposite order if I were writing it, but I'm, I'm, this is the exact quote from what he wrote. Um, so the fossils appear, and then once they appear, they don't change, and then they disappear. So sudden appearance. He says, in any local area, a species does not arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. Um, okay, so this is, this is the, um, his observation. This is not what we are typically led to believe by the way evolution is taught, but this is nevertheless the data. Now you would think that with this, th that this kind of data would then cause an evolutionist to question whether the assumptions behind the interpretation of that data is correct. Um, instead, what happens is he um, proposed an alternative explanation that still fits within this umbrella of evolution because evolution is kind of this, this mor morphing, changing thing that um, it's a slippery, it's a, it's a really slippery thing to deal with um, because 
it's so vague that the anyone who proposes pro, any proponent of evolution can just sort of explain the data away by changing uh, the definitions of things. Um, but uh, uh, so I won't get into how he. I mean, he proposed this thing called punctuated equilibrium, but we won't get into that. Um, what I do want to talk about is these transitional forms. So if you saw from that last quote, he said that basically you shouldn't expect transitional forms of the fossil record. So again, there's this famous quote of his right here, which is the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. So there are a couple of things to note here. Um, first, he says that transitional forms are rare and they're not just rare, but they're extremely rare. Um, and then the other thing he says is that this is the trade secret of paleontology. And I, sure he would probably take this back if he could um, because it's kind of bad right as a scientist a, I mean a trade secret is something that you as an insider know that other people outside don't know and he's basically here openly admitting that what we know as paleontologists tends not to for whatever reason um, not attributing motive here but it tends not to get out to the public right um, which is which is not consistent with what science claims to be trying to do. Um, and he goes on, he says, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and at the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable. So in his mind, it's reasonable, but the rest is inference. It's not the evidence of fossils. So he's saying the evidence doesn't actually um, lead one directly to this conclusion, but rather this is the conclusion that people um, come up with because it's reasonable in his mind. Uh, let me see if I've lost, if I've lost my mouse. Give me just a second. Where did my mouse go? Here it is. I'm just going to try to improve this so I can see my slides better. Okay. Um, let's continue. Um, <clears throat> okay. So how common are these transitional forms? Um, I'll give you one example. So the brachiopods are, are, um, so if you looked at the fossil record, um, I, I, it's something like 95% of them are invertebrates. So um, a very small percentage of the fossil record are, are the things that we think of in terms of like dinosaurs or whales or um, you know, other kinds of animals that we, we, I won't say care, well, animals that we care about, right? As a, as a non expert, non-scientist. Um, but most of the fossil record are invertebrates. A lot of things that most of us would consider kind of boring. So these brachiopods are these kind of things. The fossil record is very, um, is almost complete for them, 80% complete, whereas for the higher level forms, it's um, uh, much less complete. And in the brachiopods, all the major taxa, all the major different kinds of brachiopods, they just appear suddenly, they appear independently, and they're fully specialized to their environment. Um, so there are essentially no transitional forms for these kind of animals um, from what I've read. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then with the higher level animals like mammals, reptiles, and birds and so forth, the record is much more spotty. Um, and so then the evolutionists have now convinced themselves that we wouldn't expect to see transitional forms because the record is so spotty. And so you get to, um, <clears throat> I've been reading this book by Jerry Coyne, who's a, a, another leading evolutionist who's still alive. Um, he's from the University of Chicago. And he, uh, he uh, so here's a quote of his where he says, what counts as fossil evidence for a major evolutionary transition? So he's asking the question of, you know, what would we count as fossil evidence for a transition from one type to another? According to evolutionary theory, for every two species, no matter how different, there was once a single species that was the ancestor of both. And we would call this, this one species the missing link. As we've seen, this is still a direct quote from him, as we've seen, the chance of finding that single ancestral species in the fossil record is almost zero. Uh, the fossil record is simply too spotty for that. Okay, so this is actually quite interesting. So again, a leading evolutionist is telling us not to expect data to support the, the I don't want to call it a theory, not to, to support the story, right? The story of evolution um, is not going to be supported by the data directly. Okay, now would he then admit that there's no data? No, he, he, he would argue that there's lots of data, but it's not direct, it's more indirect. Um, and if you read carefully, I'm gonna, the next slide will explain this a little bit better. What, if you read carefully, what he's saying is that you have two species, they have an ancestor, we shouldn't expect to find that single common ancestor for those two species. Okay, so we'll look at one example. We'll look at the example of the whales um, and the evolution of whales in just a minute. First, I want to um, 
trying to explain what this means, this quote that he just, that he just gave. And that is, uh, so imagine two modern species. So you have hippos and you have whales. They're alive today. Um, you can find fossils of both. Um, you, can other, you can also find fossils in the fossil record that look like whales, and you can find fossils that look like hippos, okay, depending on, you know, what criteria you're looking for. And then you might be able to find some fossil in the fossil record that looks similar to a hippo and a whale. And then you construct a story now um, where you interpret the, the, the layers of the fossil record as time, and you construct this story where you have these millions of intermediary species with missing fossils, um, but you can connect the dots and, um, and so doing support your story of evolution, of macroevolution, okay? And this missing link here right in the middle, we shouldn't expect to find a fossil of a creature that's a direct ancestor of both the hippo and the whale because the fossil record is too spotty for that. So we're gonna have to just content ourselves to find a cousin. Um, but you can see this really opens up the door for wide latitude in interpretation. Um, because the kind of things you would normally, the kind of arguments you might normally use to falsify something being the direct answer of, ancestor of two, of two uh, species, now you can't use that anymore because it's a cousin, it's not a direct ancestor. Um, so again, this is from the evolutionists themselves, how they um, look for evidence in the fossil record to convince themselves that their story is correct, okay? Are there any questions yet so far? If you have a question, unmute yourself and ask it or raise your hand virtually and, and Henry can, can do that for me. Um, and Henry can let me know, okay? If you have other questions in the future, just feel free to, to interrupt. Uh, okay, so let's look at whale evolution. Uh, so again, Stephen Jay Gould and Jerry Coyne are the two evolutionists that we'll be quoting today. So Stephen Jay Gould says, He's talking about whale evolution. This sequential discovery of picture-perfect intermediacy and the evolution of whales stands as a triumph in the history of paleontology, okay? So he likes this example of whales, okay? So I'm not, pick, I'm not picking an example that evolutionists don't like. Um, quote, he's continuing the quote, I cannot imagine a better tale for popular presentation of science or a more satisfying and intellectually based political victory over lingering creationist opposition. Um, so again, he's, he's very, as an evolutionist, very excited about this idea of evolution of whales. Now, this was not always the case. He says before this quote um, that he, on his shelf, um, as a professor at Harvard, he has a bunch of creationist books. He says every single creationist book points out the fact that there's no good story for the evolution of whales. So apparently this was true for a long time, but in the last, say, 30 years, the evolutionists have accumulated a massive evidence that has now given them satisfaction that this one, once long-standing problem of the evolution of whales is now no longer, not only not, it's not only not a problem anymore, but it's now one of their best success stories. Okay. So, um, so that was Stephen Jay Gould. And then Jerry Coyne um, talking about whales says, whales happen to have an excellent fossil record. This is one of our best examples of an evolutionary transition. Okay. So again, pick, we're picking an example that they like to promote themselves. Um, but it's helpful to keep the history in mind. So in the 1860s, Darwin and his origin of species, he claimed that whales evolved from bears. So if you go um, to the wilderness and you see a bear at the edge of a stream and it's grabbing fish from the stream and then putting it in its mouth, he said that's actually kind of similar to how a whale eats food from the sea. And so you can kind of imagine over time, this bear becoming more and more whale-like until it's a full whale. A, a, a full whale. Um, and people have ridiculed him from that from day one up until the present because uh, it's kind of a, a strange idea. Um, but nevertheless, um, that, was, that was his belief in the 1860s. Well, fast forward 100 years in the 1970s, which, when, which is, must be when Stephen Jay Gould was writing, yeah, I said I wasn't sure when the year was because Stephen Jay Gould's, it, it, the book's a collection of essays um, that was compiled afterwards. So, but it must have been in the 70s because I've read elsewhere that, so in the 70s, um, they said that whales evolved from, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, um, mes mesonychids, I guess, um, which are carnivorous land mammals. Um, because when you read Stephen Jay Gould's 
history, his, his essay, this is what he talks about. He says, whales evolved from these mesonychids, these carnivorous land mammals. Um, but then in the 1980s, they, they found something called a pachycetus, which is a wolf-sized land mammal, as we'll see. But the word cetus means whale. And so at the time they discovered it, they claimed this was an ancestor of a whale or a pseudo ancestor, if you will. It's sort of like a cousin of the ancestor of the whale, okay? So it changed from bears to these carnivorous land mammals to a wolf-sized land mammal, which is different. And then when, uh, and then they changed in the 2000s to, um, so the, to these artiodactyls, which are um, animals with even toed, even number of toes, right? Which include hippos and pigs and so forth. So the current, story according to say Jerry Coyne who's writing later than Stephen Jay Gould is now that whales evolved from something that whales and hippos have a common ancestor as opposed to whales and these uh, carnivorous land mammals. So the point is they keep changing the story. Again it makes it very hard to disprove because as soon as you find evidence to disprove one thing they just change to something else. Um, and again it kind of I think points to the uncertainty of their story if they have to keep changing it every few years. But nevertheless, it doesn't um, affect their certainty of their belief, right? They still remain committed to the story. Okay, so this is a figure from Jerry Coyne's book. Um, this is uh, 2009, so it's fairly recent within the last 10 years. And this is his diagram of how whales evolved. Um, now, one thing to note before we dive into the details is to the right of every one of these fossils is a little shadow. Oh, so this is interpreted as time, right, from bottom to top, but not exactly as you'll see. Um, but, but these little shadows are, are, are the actual size, um, at least the relative sizes. So the, uh, I think he did this to sort of try to avoid any um, obvious objection that he was hiding the data. So he actually is, to his credit, presenting the data here, although he doesn't talk about the sizes. So the, this ancestor of a whale is this little teeny tiny thing there at the bottom, and then they get progressively larger and sort of more whale-like as you go up from bottom to top, okay? So let's go through these one at a time. So the, uh, so the first animal at 48 million years ago is a raccoon-sized animal. It has ears and teeth similar to whales, according to the evolutionist, and that's why they believe it's an ancestor. Then you have uh, pachycetus, and again, cetus means whale. So this is the same pachycetus we saw before. And what's interesting is this is actually older, right? So this is 52 million years instead of 48 million years. Um, and it's wolf size. So it's a little bit bigger. It has simpler teeth. Um, and it, the, it's claimed to have whale. So Jerry says in his book that it has whale-like ears. Um, although we'll talk about that in a minute because I've read conflicting things uh, from Stephen Jay Gould himself, actually, um, that it doesn't have whale-like ears. Um, okay, and then the next one's ambulocetus. <clears throat> Again, cetus means whale. A little bit more recent, it is a sea, it's, a, it's the size of a sea lion and it has an elongated skull, which doesn't really look like a whale skull, but it's getting longer. And it has limbs with hooves. And then a few million years later, there's rhodocetus, which is 10 feet long. So again, a little bit longer. And, or actually that's about the same size, I guess. Um, and then it has a small pelvis. And because it has a small pelvis, it's like the pelvis is shrinking over time and the hind limbs are shrinking and the nostrils are further back on the, on the head. And then you get to um, uh, Derudon, which is 40 million years ago. And <clears throat> this is even larger. It has a short neck like a whale. It has a blowhole and a small pelvis again. And then you get to Belina, which is a modern whale at 35 million years ago. So this transition from about 50 million to about 35 million years ago is about 15 million years, which actually is very small in an evolutionary time frame. And there are some evolutionists who object to this story because they know that that's not enough time. But we're going to lay that aside. We're going to lay that objection aside for the moment and just deal with the, these, this particular um, story and, and, and set of arguments. Um, now, in reality, just to kind of fast forward, um, just so you just so you understand my interpretation of this data, um, the um, and what I think is the correct interpretation, and, and because they've, it, you, you'll see. So, um, so the bottom four of these are actually land mammals, um, and there's no evidence of a blowhole in any of them. And then the top two are aquatic animals. Um, the top one's obviously a whale, and the one right below it, the Duridon, is probably just another form of whale or something like that. Um, uh, although, yeah, I, I, yeah. So it's either a whale or something similar. 
Okay, so these bottom four are actually just land mammals. So you still have this huge gap from land mammals to aquatic animals with no transitions in between those two. And someone would say, oh, well, you know, I can never satisfy you because I can never get enough, you know, enough transitional animals. Well, I mean, there's, there's a sense in which that's true, that if you're looking for a gradual, a gradual transition, um, you'll maybe you'd never be satisfied. On the other hand, this is a huge leap, as we'll see. Um, so what we're going to do is fo just focus on these middle three, the Pachycetus, the Ambulocetus, and the Rhodocetus, okay? Um, and we are going to do these in the order in which they were uh, found, as well as the, from the oldest to the youngest. So we're going to start with the Pachycetus at the bottom and then work our way up to Ambulocetus and Rhodocetus, okay? So the Pachycetus, this is number one. Um, on the right is the cover of science, um, of the science journal. So um, there are two leading journals in science. There's one of them is called Science, which is this one, and the other one's called Nature. And Science and Nature are the two um, most prestigious journals. If if a researcher gets his or her paper published in one of these journals, it's a really really big deal. Um, so Phil Gringrich is a professor at University of Michigan. In 1983 is when he published his finding of the Pachycetus. Um, so Pachycetus, Cetus is whale, Pachy is because it was found in Pakistan. And um, this is the cover of this most prestigious journal that was then used to um, convince the American public that the um, evolution of the, that, that there had been a major discovery in the evolution of a whale. And so you have this artistic rendering of something that's kind of kind of land-like and kind of whale-like because it's in the transition between the two. Okay. So Phil Gingrich in his paper um, argued that it's a semi-aquatic semi -aquatic transitional form. So it's partly on land, partly in the sea. Um, he drew this reconstruction or he at least he gave him the rough draft for it. Um, and the sole link really is because of the, the ear bone. So the idea is that if you study the ear bone of this animal, it appears to be similar to the whale's ear bone. But what's interesting is I was reading Stephen Jay Gould, he says it's not whale-like at all because it lacks the large jaw hole that holds the fat pad. So whales, because they're underwater, they have a, whole, they have a different way of hearing than we do above land. And it, there's a lot of complexity involved to, to make it possible for it to hear underwater like that. Um, and, uh, and so the evidence, according to Stephen Jay Gould, is not even there for, for that one similarity, but that one similarity is all that he had. So this artistic rendering on the right was based solely on the skull that you see there, right? And it's not even a full skull, it's just a partial skull. So I, so I wrote the, the shaded areas were found. So if you can tell, there's just a small percentage of the skull that was actually found. This is the type of artistic license that's used by evolutionists in promoting their story um, and you can kind of, you can kind of understand the motivation, right? So Phil Gingrich as a faculty member who's trying to get his work known and cited and wants to get more funding and wants to be successful in his career, it has every motivation to try to tell a good story, um, which he did. He took, he found a fossil and he told a good story about it. Um, and then there's really essentially no checks and balances in the system because then the the um, the reviewers of the journal, the editor of the journal, publish the story, and then everyone in the mainstream media, the Smithsonian, all these other museums, then take it up as as if it were true or if it had some truth to it. Okay, so this is 1983, and then what happens is the story then propagates for a whole generation before um, new evidence is found to disprove it. And this is a common thing, and it's a it's a and it's always changing, right? So you never can really keep up with this because it's always changing. So um, in 2001, a student of Phil Gingrich, um, the, the same guy we mentioned um, in the previous slide, um, he found, uh, he published, uh, they, they found more bones over time and then they published a new article <clears throat> based on the new evidence. And the new evidence shows that it's actually more like, um, like a taper or some other kind of land mammal. So there's no blowhole. Um, there are no flippers, um, they're just hooves, and there's no whale neck, just a typical land neck. Um, and so even he himself in the article argues that this is really just a land mammal, 
it's a runner, the feet touch, the, feet touch the ground and so forth. Now you would think this, this new evidence would have falsified the hypothesis. So they started with a hypothesis, nothing wrong with having a hypothesis. Um, there is something wrong with, I think, selling that to the public, but that's, but that's done, right? Um, at this point, um, the hypothesis should have been falsified, but instead what they did was they said, oh, it's a terrestrial whale or it's a terrestrial cetacean, right? Cetacean being whale. Now, at this point, the word whale becomes meaningless, but it's, again, this kind of switch and bait that they do, um, where first they find a fossil, they call it a whale, then they find out that that animal was actually on land, and so they say that this is now a, a, a whale that was on land, right? But again, this is not falsifiable. This is not really science anymore. This is really storytelling. And even years later, as of 2009, Phil Gingrich himself still um, classifies the Pachycetus as a whale based on the ear bone, um, even though it's plate-like rather than finger-like, right? And that's getting a little technical and it's certainly out of my expertise as I'm just relating to you things that I've read uh, with regard to that detail. So um, as of 2012, um, so again, that, that 1983 was the first discovery. 2001 was the second discovery and published and, and paper, right? 11 years later, the American Museum of the National History in New York still had on the top right there that um, this fossil being shown to the public of this um, evidence for whale evolution, but it's not even a true reconstruction. So this, this fossil has a blowhole on the top, which is not like, if you actually compare what the museum is presenting with what's in the paper of 2001, they don't even match up. So the paper itself is, is honest about what the find is. The museum is being, is misleading the public into what the evidence is, okay? So there's no actual blowhole in the fossil itself, but there is a blowhole here in the museum to make it look more whale-like. And the eyes are actually in the creature on top, as you'll see in the diagram below, in the drawing below there, but in the fossil, this, this, sorry, maybe I should clarify. This photograph in the top right, this is not a, this is not a fossil. This is a reconstruction of a fossil. So the actual fossil is in some laboratory somewhere. What's presented in the museum, because there's so few of these, is not an actual fossil. This is a reconstruction, but the reconstruction is not done meticulously to make it as similar as possible to the actual fossil. What they did is they used artistic license in putting this reconstruction together, and they put the eyes on the side to make it look more like a whale, when in reality with this new evidence, uh, which may have been acceptable with the first fossil from 1983, but with the new fossil from 2001, it's not justified anymore. Um, and so at the bottom, what's interesting is you'll see this is an art, the artist reconstruction of the same animal in the exact same museum. Um, and you can go to this, this website at the bottom there. You can go to the, the, the American Museum of Natural History in New York. They have the artist rendering at the bottom, which doesn't match the fossil that was there as of a few years ago, at least. I don't know if it's still there or not now. Um, and so again, you see this discrepancy where people are being misled the public's being misled about what the data actually is. Okay, so I, I'm fine with disagreeing with someone over the interpretation of the data, but when the data itself is not presented honestly, then um, it, it um, helps to explain why creationist distrust um, sort of the, the, the system, right? Because you can see here the system is failing in a big way. Um, okay, so any questions about number one? Any questions about this Pachycetus? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask or raise, press the little icon to raise your hand. Okay, I know this is kind of technical. I hope you can bear with me. I am um, uh, trying to make this as, <laughs> as accessible as possible, but there's a lot of technical detail here, I know. Um, so the second one, so the first one was Pachycetus, the second one was Ambulocetus. The Ambulocetus literally means swimming walking whale. So, I mean, what better name could you have for like supporting your story of evolution? And this is the drawing at the Smithsonian of this thing. Only two of these have ever been found. Um, so we have limited data to go on. There's no tail, uh, there's no flippers, and there's no blowhole. Um, and the backbone ends in a pelvic bone, which is unlike a whale, <clears throat> and the eyes are on top of, a, of, a, of the head, unlike a whale. So this is really a typical land animal. This was published in 1994. <clears throat> so in between those two papers I just mentioned earlier, the 1983 paper and the 2001 paper of 
Pacasita. So this is in between those. <clears throat> and this is the same uh, Thuisson um, professor who was formerly a student of Phil Greengrich. Um, so these are leading um, paleontologists. Um, and there's, uh, there's a guy named Carl Werner. Carl Werner is a, is a creationist who has put together a book and a video called Evolution the Grand Experiment. And he actually went and interviewed both of these scientists. And he uh, specifically, and you can click on this link here at the bottom and you can watch these videos for yourself. They're pretty short. They're like two or three minutes. Um, so he's interviewing this um, evolutionist professor who, uh, ab about the, his own research, right? And, and on camera, he says that this ear bone apparatus, um, which is the primary evidence for saying that this is whale-like, um, it may not actually be like a whale, right? So it might be like a whale or it might not be like a whale. The, the evidence really isn't clear. So he says this one is as questionable as the Pacasitas, the previous one, okay? So again, he, with his um, bias toward supporting the story that he already believes is interpreting the data to fit that story. But that doesn't mean that the data supports the story. The data could go either way. Um, and then at the bottom there, it says, my last point there is his lab supplied models to museums around the world with a blowhole in the snout, uh, even though the, the, um, the actual fossil doesn't have a blowhole in the snout. Um, so here's the reconstruction on the left that you'll see in museums where this ambulocetus has this kind of rudimentary blowhole. Now, again, there, there's this whole separate question of would a rudimentary blowhole actually do you any good or not, right? Which it actually wouldn't because you need the hole to go all the way through and you need all the musculature and you need um, um, you know, the blood vessels. You need all these very complex systems to be able to use that blowhole. Nevertheless, this is what's shown in a museum. And on the right is the actual skull itself. Okay, so on the left-hand side of the neck, the, the body is to the left, which I had to crop to make it fit the, the screen. Um, and then this is the actual head, which you can see is, has a lot of the, um, the lower jaw, but it doesn't have all of the upper, um, the upper jaw. And so he had to just guess. And so in this video, which you can watch, it's, uh, the Wilson says um, in the blue here in the bottom, it says, so that's, uh, so that's based on related animals. When he says that, he's talking about this blowhole. Um, it's based on related animals, which all have a nasal opening way in the front, okay? And which ones, which animals have the opening way in the front? Well, uh, Cuchicetus, which is a different one, and Pacasetus, which you've already seen, doesn't have a blowhole. So he took an animal, Pacasetus, that doesn't have a blowhole and used it to infer that this Ambulocetus does have a blowhole, okay? So again, you can see this is fitting a story to the data, not fitting, or I'm sorry, fitting, a, fitting the data to the story, not fitting the story to the data. Okay, so that was number one and two, Pacasetus and Ambulocetus. The third one in our, in our um, collection here is Rhodocetus. Um, this, is April, this was published in April 1994, so again, in between those two dates, uh, Phil Gingrich again. Um, and um, this um, skeleton that was found has an elongated skull. It has nost nostrils that are a little further back. It has these extensions on the backbone to anchor the tail. It has a smaller pelvis and some small hind limbs. And so from these data, he concluded that this must be, again, on the, uh, 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 on the, on the road to, to evolution of, of, a, of a real whale, right? So he claimed this was an aquatic animal with front flippers and a whale-like tail with flukes. So the fluke is that very large horizontal flat shape of the whale's tail that allows it to propel itself through the water. But as you can see here, there's no evidence, there's no fossil evidence for the flippers or the tail. And again, you can watch this video, it's very in, in, insightful um, to, to sort of understand how science works. Um, because he unabashedly on camera in this interview admits that um, the, the data is not there, right? But I don't think he, I don't think it bothers him or it doesn't seem to bother him because I, I think he, that's just the way science works. You could get some data you construct some sort of hypothesis, you write your paper, you promote it, you get some notoriety, and then you kind of move on to the next thing. Um, so he, so these are direct quotes from that video, which you can watch. I, so I speculated it might have had a fluke, okay? So again, this is speculation. This is not science. And since then, he says, we found the four limbs. It does not have the kind of arms that can be spread out like flippers that are on a whale. And I now doubt that Rhodocetus would have had a fluke tail. <clears throat> so he's... Um, He's, in, he's admitting not only did he speculate, but he's also changed his mind on it. So what he believes 
is not what's actually being presented in museums and textbooks and so forth anymore. Um, so, so when it comes to something like whale evolution, I think there are a few questions that we should, we should ask um, ourselves and to evolutionists. Number one is, is the hypothesis falsifiable? So the way science works is you have to have a falsifiable hypothesis. You have to have um, a story that could go, that, that could be either supported or denied based on the evidence. But in this case, you can see the story is constantly changing. It's constantly morphing. I cannot convince myself that there's a falsifiable hypothesis here because no matter what the data is, it, the interpretation is just massaged ever so slightly or maybe not ever so slightly to convince themselves that it's actually true. The second thing is, I think really the way to, to argue this sort of thing is to, to, to look more closely at genetics. Um, so what's interesting is, I, I mean, I think 150 years ago when Darwin was doing his writing, it was justifiable to have, to do the kind of illustrations that Jerry Coyne did, where you have these pictures and you kind of convince yourself that they look, you know, from bottom to top, they start looking longer, they look bigger, the, 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 um, jaw gets larger and so forth. But these are very um, elementary type arguments. Now that we know how genetics works, we know that every feature on that, on every one of those creatures is varied, has to have a genetic code, okay? And we know that mutations cannot be the explanation. We talked about that already. So genetic mutations is often thrown out as the explanation, but that's not true because genetic mutations never give rise to new information. They never give rise to new organs. So it can't be mutations. It has to be recombination. Recombination is actually the primary mechanism of natural selection. What is recombination? Recombination is the idea that if you're, um, you know, if your mom has brown eyes and your dad has brown eyes, you might actually have blue eyes because there might be recessive genes on both sides. So recombination is taking the existing material in the two parents, um, in the case of sexual reproduction, or one parent if it's asexual reproduction, you take the, the genetic information that's already there and you shuffle that data. That's recombination. And that's what accounts for the large amount of variety. So if you look at a, a Dotson versus a Great Dane versus a Terrier uh, versus a Poodle, these different kinds of dogs, it's not genetic mutation that causes the new kinds of dogs. It's the reshuffling of that information that was already present in the original dog kind. Um, and so what that means is that if, if you want to believe that these um, animals evolved from each other, um, you'd have to then agree that every organ in the descendant must have had genetic instructions in the ancestor, which means that that original ancestor must have, must have, had, must have had, by the laws of genetics, such a complex DNA that it was allowed to express itself as either a terrestrial animal or an aquatic animal. Now, I would argue that that's a, that sort of thing is, is possible in principle, but it's not really possible in practice. In practice, that's not what we see um, at the kind of scale of whale versus a land mammal like a taper. <clears throat> okay, and then the other interesting thing is that <clears throat> there's, um, there's a series of articles in, um, in 2011, you can just find this if you Google ancient whale jawbone found in Antarctica, there are a few links at the bottom there. And they claim that researchers found a 49 year old, 49 million year old whale jawbone, a fully functioning uh, aquatic um, full sized whale, 49 million years old. And if you, if you were to go back to the earlier slide, you would see that that's actually older than the Rhodocetus. So it's older than some of these fossils that are being presented as ancestors or cousins of ancestors of whales. So it completely messes up the timeline. And then what's interesting is that there's a later paper in 2016 that says that the fossils are actually not that late, they're newer. And so here again, you'll see the goalposts are shifting because, um, they have to kind of pretend like there's a consistent story. But if you can, in, you, if you can change the dates whenever you want, then you don't have data supporting your theory anymore, supporting your story. Okay, so that's all about whale evolution. Any questions about whale evolution? Okay, so, um, so we don't have time to talk about dinosaur fossils much, um, but what I want to do is address the question a little bit differently, which is what happened to the dinosaurs, okay? And what I like to say is, well, let's ask ourselves what happened to the tigers, okay? <clears throat> so I think if we answer, if we can answer to ourselves what happened to the tigers, we'll have a better grasp on what happened to the dinosaurs. So at creation, 
Dinosaurs and tigers were both created on day six, according to Genesis. In the flood, uh, Noah had this humongous ark, right? It's not like the little toy boat that we sometimes see. It's a humongous ark, and he brought dinosaurs and he brought tigers onto the ark. Now, was there enough room on the ark for, for dinosaurs? Well, let's just do a, a kind of a, a very quick, um, uh, just sort of a, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, uh, just a real quick test, just to kind of convince ourselves that it's in the ballpark at least. So here's a, here's a football field. Okay, it's a 300 feet long by 160 feet wide, not including the, the end zones. The ark was, uh, according to the scriptures, 450 feet by 75 feet. Okay, so it's longer, but not quite as wide. And if you actually take just, you know, just some kind of back of the envelope calculation, look up some of these um, dinosaurs and consider how they would have fit on the ark. There's actually plenty of room on the ark for, uh, for a fair number of dinosaurs. So here we have the Tyrannosaurus, we have the Apatosaurus, like the Brontosaurus, and we have the Allosaurus. Okay, just as three examples and kind of roughly to scale in terms of their length, okay? Now these are the full-sized adults. Um, Noah didn't have to bring the adults. Um, he could have brought juveniles and it might have, probably would have made more sense to bring juveniles, right? To bring uh, ones that weren't fully adult so that they could reproduce more and they would be smaller, easier to take care of and so forth. <clears throat> so this is an upper bound. And also as far as height goes, so the, the, the photograph shows you the, the length um, relative to the arc and then the little sidebar show you the height. So the height of the arc was 45 feet. Um, the height of each of these even fully sized animals was less than half of that. The arc was divided into three stories. So it may have been a little tight for an adult. For a juvenile, it wouldn't have been, I don't think it would have been a problem at all. Okay, so that, that question I think can be just sort of um, laid aside. <clears throat> uh, and then after the flood, Noah, um, got out of the ark, the animals left, and the diners, dinosaurs and the tigers then spread throughout the world, okay? And this is an oversimplification. I didn't do homework as to where exactly every one of them went, but they did spread through large areas um, to, to different continents and so forth. And in this photograph, you can actually see that with a lower sea level, you'd actually have more land bridges between places that there wouldn't be otherwise. That's the brown region. Um, and so um, some combination of land bridges and animals floating on rafts and so forth allows them to reach places like Australia and Madagascar. But that's, that's the, a topic for a different day, right? If we want to look at those kind of animals. But going back to tigers and dinosaurs, so they spread throughout the world, okay? And then <clears throat> mankind also got out of the ark, reproduced, um, created different cultures, civilizations, and so forth. And they um, then drew the animals that they encountered in daily life. So they drew pictures of dinosaurs and tigers on, for example, caves, right? So we have cave paintings of both. Um, and then um, in these different civilizations, so in Mesopotamia, for example, there are, uh, there's really nice artwork of animals that look like dinosaurs on the left and also animals that look like tigers on the right. So these early artists depicted both of these. Now, if you look this up, modern scholars will call these serpent leopards, right? And they'll call this a mythical creature. Um, Possible? Sure. But this is not what ancient artists typically did. What they typically did is they drew about the things that they knew about, which were the animals that they encountered in daily life. Um, so I don't think our default explanation should be mythical. Our default explanation should be real unless proved otherwise. And we'll see that um, every culture throughout the world has a record of the flood and they also have a record of dragons or dinosaurs. Um, they didn't call them dinosaurs, they called them dragons um, that they encountered. Um, animals that are very, very similar to, to, to dinosaurs. And this evidence is so compelling that you have people like uh, Carl Sagan, if you know Carl Sagan, he's not a creationist, right? He's not a Christian. He found this evidence so compelling that he felt the need to come up with an explanation for how is it that all these cultures around the world have uh, stories of dragons. And his explanation was non-scientific. His explanation was that we, because we evolved from reptiles, we kept that memory in our brain over the millions of years since the time we were reptiles. That's how we have all these stories of dragons across the world. And as you, if you think about it, that's completely non-scientific. It doesn't match anything at all about what we understand, how memory works. Um, I don't have any recollection of my great-grandparents because I descend from them. That's not how memory works. 
So, but that's the kind of explanation that people have to come up with to try to reconcile the data, which is so compelling that, um, that people did live with dragons or dinosaurs um, versus, you know, what they, what they, the story that they've, they're committed to, which is the evolution. Okay, so this is Mesopotamian art. Um, you can do this, you know, we can do this for a long time. Uh, you can do Egyptian art, right? So they, they drew um, animals that look kind of like dinosaurs. They certainly don't look like anything we have today. Um, and, um, and then they drew tigers. Um, in Cambodia, there's this Buddhist temple called Angkor Wat. They have um, a really nice um, carving of what looks like a stegosaurus uh, on the left, and they have nice carvings of, of tigers on the right. So the temple was built in the, I think, 1200s, so about 800 years ago or so. Um, I went and looked up what evolutionists say about this, and you can see the link there. Um, what they claim is that this is not a stegosaurus at all. This is a rhinoceros against a leafy background. That's their explanation for it. Uh, you can look it up and see. This is, that's from the Smithsonian Magazine. The Smithsonian Magazine also postulates that maybe these are frauds that were carved later by movie producers who are filming at the scene. Okay, so these are really, I mean, these explanations are really stretching it. Um, but nevertheless, that's what they have to resort to. That, those are the kind of arguments they resort to, to try to explain this data away. Um, thousands of years ago, the Chinese came up with a calendar, right? There were 12 months in the year based on creation. Um, they assigned animals to these 12 months. They took animals that they knew. Um, one of those was a tiger and one of those was a dragon, right? And a dragon is sort of uh, related to a dinosaur. I'm not gonna say they're exactly the same, but they're related to the dinosaur. And of course, they included the, these animals in the calendar. Why? Because they were real animals that they knew about and they encountered. Um, in the Bible, <clears throat> um, in Job, um, God is talking to Job about the, um, how powerful he is. And he brings up the example of the behemoth. And he talks about how the behemoth moves his tail like a cedar, um, which I think fits the apatosaurus or the brontosaurus much better than, say, uh, what a lot of modern translations will do in their footnotes is they'll call it a hippopotamus, which has no tail at all or not really much tail at all. Um, similarly, in the next chapter, he talks about Leviathan. And when it describes the Leviathan, it talks about his scales, right? He has a scaly body and the scales are closed. They're, they're close together. His scales are as pry, they're shoved together as with a close seal. <clears throat> And they talks about how hard it is to fight it, how no one wants to go against it. Um, and out of his nostril goes smoke, a flame goes out of his mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, again, some translations will have a footnote that says this is a crocodile, right? This is obviously not a crocodile. This is a fire breathing dragon of some sort. Okay, so this is in the Bible itself, which means that Job, it wouldn't make sense for God to bring up mythical creatures. Mythical creatures wouldn't support his argument at all. His argument is about the power, his power in creating um, animals that are, um, the power of the animals reflects the power of the creator, right? And so if they weren't real animals, they don't reflect the power of the creator, they just reflect the power of the imagination. Um, so this shows that these animals lived at the same time as Job. Um, the Bible also talks about flying serpents. Um, so this is in Isaiah. It talks about the burdens of the beasts of the south, and it lists a bunch of animals. It lists lions and vipers and asses or donkeys and camels. And in the midst of this list, it mentions fiery flying serpents, right? And we don't know exactly what these are, but we have lots of artwork throughout the centuries of people who represented creatures that they knew, which certainly look, uh, even if they're not anatomically proportionally correct, um, because the wings seem kind of small to be, actually be flying, um, nevertheless seem to capture the same kind of idea. Um, and so we can also go to the, the history books. So there's a Greek historian named Herodotus in the fifth century BC, uh, where he, he talks about the Arabian winged serpents. And he talks about how, how many there are and how they're in all the Arabia and they're not found any, you know, they're not found in other places and so forth. Um, and then we have uh, Pliny, who is another uh, uh, a naturalist, a scientist in, in uh, the first century AD in Rome. And he talks about this jaculus, this flying serpent, which darts from the branches of the trees. And he goes on with his description. And these are just highlights. These are just a couple of descriptions. There are plenty more other uh, descriptions from other historians of, of these sorts of things. Um, in 250 BC, um, there's this Roman general um, who had to kill, uh, during the first Punic War, he had to kill a 120-foot serpent while trying to cross the river. 
and its skin was displayed in Rome for 100 years. So this is not a myth, this is an actual thing. 120 foot serpent is not like anything we have today. Um, was it a dinosaur or was it just something else? I'm not clear from that description, but it certainly um, is supportive of the fact that there were large creatures living at the time of, of man um, not that long ago, right? And in the first century AD um, in India, um, so again, Pliny the Elder, he, he's a historian, he's a uh, naturalist. He wrote um, this book called The History of Nature. He wrote about a bunch of animals that he knew about. He wrote about all kinds of animals that you and I would recognize today. In the midst of that, he has a chapter, or has several chapters actually. He talks about dragons and he says, the dragons in India are always fighting with the elephants, right? So the elephants are real and the dragons are real. Um, a few centuries later, um, another uh, writer in his book, he says, the dragon is the largest animal on earth. He's found, it's found in Ethiopia and India. Um, and then of course, there are all these stories, um, which we would call legends today, but legends usually come from a kernel of truth. There's usually a real story. There's a legend based around that story that distorts the truth slightly, but the core truth is still there. <clears throat> and one of those is St. George slaying a dragon in the, um, in the early centuries of, uh, after Christ. Uh, and then we, a lot of us are familiar with the story of Beowulf, right? Beowulf is the hero that slays Grendel. Grendel is the, is the monster. And the way he slays him is kind of interesting. The way he, he goes into his cave and he hops up on him and grabs his arm and tears his arm off, right? So the arm is actually the weakest part of the animal. And if you actually look at a, a Tyrannosaurus rex, it fits that description pretty well, where you have this ferocious animal that could kill a person very easily, but has these very tiny, tiny uh, forearms, which if you could get up there and get a hold of them, you can imagine a, a, a warrior um, being able to uh, slay the animal by, by tearing one of those off and letting it bleed to death. Uh, Marco Polo uh, was a traveler. He traveled to China uh, and, and he wrote about his travels. He described great serpents, 30 feet long. He says they're hideously ugly. They have a mouth large enough to swallow a man whole. There's more details there if you want to go read about it. Um, again, these are people who are not writing fantasies, they're not writing fiction, they're documenting what they saw, they're writing histories of their travels, they're writing books of natural history about the different animals, they're writing just um, standard history. Some of these are legends that are slightly um, divorced from the actual event, but nevertheless have this core truth. And, there's, and we're just scratching the surface. There are plenty more of these, they're throughout the world, um, just trying to whet your appetite for this. Um, this is, um, uh, uh, also kind of interesting. So this is a few years ago, 2004 in South Dakota, they found this um, dinosaur, which they called Dracorex hugwartsia, right? So this is, um, and I think they let the kids of the, the children of the museum uh, name it. And they, of course, have all been reading Harry Potter. So they said, this looks like something straight out of Harry Potter. It's a complete skull, which is pretty rare. And it has this bony head, these spikes and knobs, and it looks like a fairy tale dragon. Um, so the hypothesis is this may be a juvenile. It may be that as it grows older, it loses those knobs. Um, I think scientists don't really know at this point, but the point is that there, um, there is, I mean, this is real. This is a real thing. It, it looks like it's fiction, but it's a real thing. It's, in the, it's displayed in the museum in Indiana. And it's, um, again, shows further connection between dragons and dinosaurs, right? The word, they're just two different words for the same thing. Um, and they're both kind of umbrella terms. They're different kinds of dragons. They're different kinds of dinosaurs. Um, okay, so going back to our question, what happened to them? Um, what happened to the dinosaurs? What happened to the tigers? Well, uh, would you want either of these in your backyard? Um, and, and I think the answer is probably not, right? There are people who keep tigers for pets and there are stories of, um, for example, like the Chinese emperor having dragons as pets. So when Marco Polo visited him, he had these, you know, dragons as pets. So, I mean, there are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, you're a farmer, you're trying to um, keep your cattle alive. You don't want these predators in your backyard. And so what are you going to do? Um, you're going to kill them, right? Dinosaurs and tigers both don't get along well with humans. And so um, this, the tiger population, for example, just in the last 30, 40 years has, gone, has dwindled tremendously in the wild because as the human population has increased, we're going into more and more areas. Humans are bumping up against tigers. When the humans meet the tigers, they kill them if they're allowed to. And of course, now with conservation and all that, you know, people are trying to, uh, governments are trying to prevent that from happening. But if you're a farmer, again, trying to preserve your crops, you're motivated to try to get rid of this 
um, predator that's a threat to you, your family, and your and your and your 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 livelihood. So I think it's very plausible that the dragon dinosaur extinction is similar. That if you if we had the data, we could plot the um, the the decline of the dinosaurs, and it would look something like this, but further back, probably by a hundred years or two hundred years. Um, there are many reports, as we saw in ancient history, of of dragons and dinosaurs. Um, well, I'm using those interchangeably. There are many reports in ancient history of dragons, um, and there are still many stories in the Middle Ages. Um, since about the 1800s, there are fewer and fewer stories. There's still a handful of them, but not as many. One of those is the Thunderbirds. So, in the uh, the Native Americans and um, uh, talked about these <coughs> Thunderbirds, which scientists will call them mythical creatures, but I think what they are is they're really pterosaurs that were still alive. <clears throat> as recently as a, you know, 150 years ago or so. And then you'll, you'll see these tantalizing stories, even in the 1900s, of natives in, say, Africa who are shown a picture of a, of a dinosaur um, based on fossil reconstruction, and they um, conclude, and, and, they'll, and they point to them and say, no, that's, that's the animal that I saw, or that's the animal that um, actually made this mark that attacked my my father and here's the mark on his chest to, to show you um so they have first-hand account of animals that terrorize their neighborhoods and their villages that are um that give them the ability to spot the difference between um I'd say a dinosaur and some other kind of creature right which how would they have that knowledge otherwise and you have these things like mukulamembe which is um the name for one of such animal in the Congo that the natives talk about there. Are these still alive? There are some cryptozoologists who are still trying to find these things. Um, it's possible, um, but it's also becoming less and less likely each, each, as each year passes um, that we're going to have some amazing discovery. Um, there are also stories in uh, New Guinea of um, pterosaurs of the flying, uh, the flying dinosaurs, and they have um, bioluminescence, so they actually light up at night. And so there are stories of people who say that they, as recently as, you know, say 20, 30 years ago, actually saw these lights around the sky and they think that's what it is. And there's, um, and they see tracks on the ground and they talk to the natives and the natives describe them and so forth. But so far, no, so far, nobody's actually come up with, with um, um, verifiable evidence uh, um, that these dinosaurs still exist, except for the fact that we still have Komodo dragons and some other animals like that, that on a smaller scale do, um, I think, I think are relatives of the dinosaurs. So in some sense, they haven't gone extinct, just like the tigers haven't gone extinct. Okay, last thing I want to say before we run out of time, which is, um, and many of you may know this already, but dinosaurs are supposed to be millions and millions of years old, but just in the last 20 years or so, um, uh, researchers led primarily by Mary Schweitzer, who's a professor at the North Carolina State University. Um, she has a series of papers uh, found and confirmed um, more and more evidence that soft tissue is in dinosaur bones. Um, and <clears throat> if, and, and so it's interesting. So if these were not from dinosaur bones, they're supposed to be millions of years old. No one would believe that they could be millions of years old because soft tissue is not supposed to last that long. It's supposed to break down much faster. So the reaction from the scientific community has been to either dismiss her methods and say that she's She's doing something wrong. She's corrupting her data, which she says, look, I've been doing this for 30 years and I keep finding more and more things. And I've, I've come up, I've, I've uh, discovered techniques that are, um, that are provable, provably successful. And then she says, they'll, they'll use some other technique and say it doesn't work. And she said, well, yeah, that's because you're not using my technique. She keeps publishing papers. They keep getting accepted in the mainstream science community. Um, I think eventually they're going to have to acknowledge this, but what they've done is also tried to explain it away by saying that, oh, these, these things can last longer than we thought. Instead of them lasting a few hundred or thousand years, they actually can last, last for millions of years. And they come up with, again, moving the goalpost, changing, inventing science to try to fit the story rather than using the data to support the story. And that's all I have. Um, I don't think we have a lot of time for questions, but maybe one, one or two questions. I hope, it, hope it's been helpful. I know it's kind of technical. I know it's kind of, kind of a lot to take in. Um, so I hope it was accessible to you. Why don't we um, close then in a word of prayer? Father, thank you for um, 
for uh, enabling us, Lord, to live in a time we have access to so much information. We pray that you would give us wisdom and, and handling this information to understand it. We pray that our ultimate goal would be to glorify you, to enjoy you, to, to praise you uh, for your creation, for your wonder, for your, for your love. Um, and uh, we thank you for, for Christ and for the love which you shed on the cross for our sins. We thank you for the love you shed to us in him. We pray that you would bless our time of worship, Lord, in this um, unusual setting, and that you would enable us, Lord, to nevertheless um, join our, our hearts with one voice to, to worship you and to, to honor you. Um, and we ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, if anyone has follow-up questions, feel free to email me or call me or text me or whatever and, and let me know or... Um, or otherwise, um, any Henry, Henry, or Pastor Joe, is there anything else you want to? Yes, say? there is a quick announcement that the uh, AV team has been able to figure out how to stream to YouTube and Facebook. So, those who are watching over the YouTube stream, uh, make sure you refresh your browser, and you should be able to start to see the Sunday service. They'll be broadcasting from church, which has a higher bandwidth, so hopefully, it'll be okay. So that's it. Okay. Hey, Henry, Henry, is there a YouTube link that was sent out? Uh, you should be able to go to YouTube. I don't know if it was uh, sent out, but I can ask Wendy to post it. But I think you should be able to search for Living Hope Bible Church on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask Wendy. Thanks. So, so, Henry, to clarify, can most of the people stay here for worship or do they have no. to leave and rejoin? There's, the worship will not be shown through Zoom. You'll have to go to the uh, either Facebook page or the YouTube channel. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.